What finally fills them in the 1870s is uh, the courthouse. New York City needs a new courthouse, has been a new courthouse since like the 1700s, uh, since Federal Hall, where they swore in Washington, DC, uh, Washington in, uh, president uh, in uh, 1789. Uh, and so uh, what happens is the Tammany Hall party, they decide to build a new courthouse, they buy land, uh, and they, they farm out all the contracts to all their political allies, right? Uh, and so it turns out finally that the carpeting, uh, an investigation by the New York Times discovers the carpeting is being laid by an old lady who's blind at the cost of like $250 a square foot. Uh, and of course it turns out that her sons, like brothers, friends, husband, whatever, is a guy in the Tammany Hall. So they, they did this contract to this lady. She collects all the money, keeps some, passes the rest along to a series of people, and it all just disappears as bribes, right? Uh, and so the cost of the courthouse is something like 10 times the initial projection because it just keeps getting inflated because of corruption, right? And that finally blows up uh, the Tammany Hall machine. There's a great cartoon Thomas Nast does of all the Tammany Hall guys in a circle, and the caption is, where's the money? And they just keep pointing at the guy next to them and around and it goes in the circle, right? Uh, the head of it is a guy known as Boss Tweed, who's this enormously rotund guy with a big orange beard, and when he gets indicted on federal corruption charges, he flees to Spain, and he loses like 200 pounds in lockup, and when he gets to the port in Spain, he jumps ship in Spain, and a Spanish dockhand actually recognizes him because he's so infamous. The trial is so famous, they even know about it in Spain, and he gets caught, and he spends a bunch of time in Sing Sing, a uh, correctional facility up the river in New York State. Uh, and Tilden was lucky. Ironically, uh, before the fall of Tammany Hall, he was a nobody. He was a Democrat, not part of Tammany Hall, which meant that you were like, what, less important than a homeless guy, right? I mean, you're nobody. But when Tammany Hall blows up, all of a sudden, those powerless Democrats who had nothing to do with Tammany Hall are influential, right? So here comes Tilden to run for president uh, in 1876. Tilden's big thing was a really good one. He wanted to have a federal civil uh, uh, reform, civil service reform act. The civil service is all the people who work for the government, right? Post office guys, IRS tax collectors, customs inspectors, uh, you know, federal uh, marshals, uh, fish and wildlife guys, uh, park rangers. The way it works is that since the beginning of the presidency, since the beginning of the country, every single one of those people worked for the president. And at the beginning of every presidential administration, the president can fire all of them, uh, down to the post office guy in Poughkeepsie, you know, uh, New, New York, right? He could fire he could fire our local postman because that guy doesn't work for the county, he doesn't work for the state, he works for the federal government, right? And if you're the president, that was one of your big powers, was patronage. You could say to people, look, I need your votes to become president of the United States of America, so get your state delegation to vote for me at the convention. Get your state to help vote for me in the election, and I will reward you with jobs, right? Do you know what he would? Everybody's got a, a brother-in-law who's a loser who needs a job. Everybody's got a cousin who's an idiot who could use a job. Uh, everybody, and of course, you say, hey, hey uh, you, you help me out. I can get you a post office job, kick me 10% of your salary, right? Nice, cushy job. Ironically, for African Americans in the South, that was one of the jobs they could get. The federal government often dispensed post office jobs uh, to African Americans in the South, which were great jobs with a good salary, right? Uh, and so that was one of the big powers the federal government has, the power of patronage, right? Uh, if you don't play ball, uh, if you don't play ball, Senator from Pennsylvania, I'll fire every single person connected to you in the state of Pennsylvania. And then you don't have any friends in the state government, right? You don't have any allies. You have, you can't help anybody, right? Uh, and so that's why being friends of the president is good, uh, and he's got this power. So, well, on the other hand, Lincoln hated it, because Lincoln said being president, other than the whole war thing, is one nonstop parade of people who want jobs from you and will not leave you alone, right? And so what Tilden wants to do, it's a good idea, is he wants to take the federal government workforce and divide it into two tiers. The bottom tier, maybe the bottom 80%, uh, are people that we hire for their competence, right? You maybe make them take a test uh, or something like that, and like if it's a, you're a tax collector, maybe you take a math test, and then we just give them the job, and as long as they don't do a bad job, as long as they're good at it, you just let them do that job forever, and the president doesn't really hire or fire those people. The top level of the jobs, like the head of the IRS, the head of the State Department, ambassadors to foreign countries, those jobs the president would then remove and then refill, right? And so it would reduce the president's power a lot, right? He couldn't go to somebody like the governor of Pennsylvania and say, I'm gonna make sure every single person in your state is a Republican who hates your guts. Uh, and you can't do that anymore, right? On the other hand, it would make the president's job a lot easier. Uh, we have a really, really, really good idea. Uh, as it turns out, uh, we'll back, it will finally happen in the 1880s, as it turns out. Uh, and it is a good idea, right? Today, if you go to work for the federal government, if you go to be an FBI agent, a tax collector, a park ranger, a, somebody at the Smithsonian, you, you, you're a government worker, you get a rank called GS, government service, that starts at like 30 and goes up to one, I guess, as the president. 
uh, and uh, they pay your salary based on your rank, and you climb rank as you as you turn the job. But you're not a political appointee, right? The new president isn't going to fire you; he's just going to ignore you. He might change the head of your agency, right? If you work for the IRS, he might get a new IRS director, but not the IRS workers who presumes we hire because they're good at collecting taxes or investigating fraud or whatever it is that they do, right? Uh, and so it's actually really, really, really not a bad idea. And it makes the federal uh, bureaucracy generally less political, right? The, if you talk to IRS agents today, they don't really care so much about politics. They, uh, they care about doing the job they do, which is like, I investigate fraud or I, I prosecute you know, people who do tax scams or whatever. Uh, and so even today, right now though, uh, the president still has 4,100 jobs to fill when he comes in as the new president. So if you, if you get elected president, uh, you're supposed to have a lead on that before you get to the White House, because on day one they're gonna say, cool, who are you gonna hire for this giant stack of jobs, which is ambassadors to every country in the world, the UN ambassador, the secretaries of every department, the heads of all the government agencies, ATF, FBI, CIA, DIA, DSS. Uh, you gotta hire all those people, right? Uh, but that's way less than the like, 350,000 people or whatever that work for the federal government, not including the military, right? And so that's told it's hobby horse. It's not a bad one. He's a reform-minded guy. He said, look, you know, we don't need we don't need presidents choosing who's gonna collect your taxes. That doesn't make any sense, right? On the other hand, I guess it is uh, the uh, Republican governor of Ohio, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. Hayes had been a general in the Civil War. Like every Republican president, from Grant all the way up to McKinley, he will have been connected to the Civil War in some fashion. McKinley, he was elected in 1896, was a corporal. Uh, because at that point, it's, it's 30 years, so he couldn't have been that old during the Civil War. It's been a while, right? Uh, and so uh, why is Hayes being a general important? It's very simple. Because if you're a Republican in the late 19th century, what are you going to campaign on when you run for political office? Remember that time the Civil War was awesome and we won it, it was great, and I fought in it? Like, here's my uniform, here's a picture of me in the uniform, right? I'm stabbing a Confederate or whatever. Uh, and so if you're a, if you're a Republican, the, the things that you run on, you say the Democrats are the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Uh, rum because they support alcohol. Romanism because they appeal to those drunk Irish voters who want Catholic schools where they can teach their kids Catholic mysticism not to be good Americans, right? And rebellion because they're all former Confederates, right? Uh, and it turns out that works. It works. Uh, it, it, it gets you victories. Uh, in the 1970s, if you're a Republican running for office practically anywhere in the country, uh, other than maybe the Northeast, if you hired a political consultant, they would say, if someone pokes you in the eye in the middle of the night, you should sit up and you should talk about how your political opponent is uh, running on uh, three issues that you would do the right thing on. Uh, and those issues are God, guns, and gays. Uh, right? If you're running for the school board in Alabama in the 1970s, if you're running for governor of uh, Mississippi in the 80s, you talk about uh, the fact that Democrats support gay rights, they want to ban prayer in school, they want to take your guns away. Uh, those are incredibly trite proposals, but it works. There's a whole generation of Republicans that get into Congress and the Senate on those issues. There's a whole generation of Republicans that get into Congress and governor's mansions and the Senate in the 1870s, uh, 80s, and 90s on rum, Romanism, and rebellion, right? Uh, and so, and that's what that's basically what Hayes runs his campaign on, right? Uh, and so again, the Democrats proved to be surprisingly resilient uh, in particular places. Uh, the Grant administration's support for Reconstruction becomes very unpopular, particularly in, in urban areas. If you'll pardon my French, uh, there's a, a particularly ghastly scene in the 18, it's like 72 or 70, yeah, 72 midterms, 74 midterms, uh, and that's when rumors abound that the, the, the Democrats call the Republicans the Black Republicans or the Negro Republicans they want to associate that in the minds of voters. Uh, and so as though you know the Republicans didn't exist before black people could vote or something. But uh, the Democrats spread rumors that the Republicans are going to take train loads of black people up from the South and move them to the North. Why? Well, they're gonna take your job. Are they gonna take your factory worker? They're gonna take your job. That black guy from the sharecropping uh, planet shouldn't be happy to have your job. He's gonna work his, your job for half of what you get paid for it. Uh, and then your friends that keep their jobs are gonna lose half of their wages too if they want to take keep the job. Uh, and so, by the way, what else do the Republicans do? They're gonna make that black guy marry your daughter, right? They're gonna make marry. Shotgun wedding is gonna happen. Now, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in, the, in my entire life. There's a, the Republican Party has no platform to forcibly marry black people to white people. They, that's not even a thing that, why would they do that? Uh, but those sorts of things work. Uh, and so the Democrats on election day, they get young girls in white dresses to hold big signs outside the polling places to say, fathers, please vote to save us from nigger husbands. Uh, and so wow. it's, the, it's the crassest thing you can say, but it works. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that Republicans begin to learn as Reconstruction winds down. If you support Reconstruction, you will lose. Uh, and so Hayes is characteristically mum on the subject. 
Uh, he just doesn't talk about it, uh, and that's it. The Republicans are also undergoing a transition. They're becoming less of the activist, pro-civil rights, big government party that Lincoln had founded. Remember, the Republican Party under Lincoln, uh, they uh, drafted troops to fight the Civil War, they issued banknotes and currency, created a federal banking system, raised income taxes, raised property taxes, chartered universities, regulated foreign trade. Uh, when Lincoln said, I would do those things in a heartbeat if I thought it was necessary to win the war. But a lot of Republicans wanted the government to do these things. Uh, the Republicans are changing. Uh, a lot of Republicans are becoming sympathetic to the idea that what we really need to do to get the economy going is to have the government not do these things. Have the government do less regulation, less taxes, let the businesses uh, boom on their own, and then uh, things will be better. Hayes is the first of this kind of Republican to really get anywhere near the White House. The problem is the election of 1876 is incredibly contested. Uh, it's very hotly contested. It's the closest presidential election probably until 2000. Uh, when uh, we remember Al Gore and George W. Bush fought over the state of Florida probably by less than 1,000 votes. Uh, so what happens is when the returns come in, um, uh, Hayes looks like he's lost, uh, but there's some, the states are disputed. Florida, of course, is disputed, as is Ohio. Uh, and so Hayes is about to concede to Tilden, and that's when James G. Blaine, who's a Republican from Maine, uh, convinces him to not concede. James G. Blaine, years later, will be embroiled in the scandal of corruption and will get known as the continental liar from the state of Maine. James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. He calls himself the plumed knight. Uh, there's a big thing where he brings in his private diaries to Congress and reads them into the congressional record to prove that he's not corrupt. And like nobody believes him, right? Uh, and so James G. Blaine says to Hayes, don't concede. Like It's too close. We don't know. Uh, you didn't win Ohio. We don't know. We don't know who won it. And if you won it, you might be president. And so the country enters this sort of twilight state where both sides claim victory, the returns are being counted, there's recounts underway, uh, and it drags on for several weeks. Uh, and finally, a kind of deal is reached. Uh, and the deal is that uh, Congress will investigate who should win the votes from each of those states. Uh, and there'll be a commission, it'll be 11 congressmen or senators, uh, and of course it's gonna be six Republicans and five Democrats. Uh, so right off the bat, you know what's gonna happen, six to five, the commission's gonna vote that Hayes should get the votes from Florida and Ohio that becomes president, right? Uh, on the other hand, the deal that is not part of the deal officially is that were Hayes to accept this arrangement, uh, when he becomes president, reconstruction is off the table, right? Reconstruction would end. And so that's essentially what exactly happens. Uh, now there's good reason to believe that the situation is a lot more complicated. It's, it's really hard to know, what, did Hayes really win? Did, did he steal it? It, it? It's really hard to know that. Uh, on the other hand, the, the deal he reached is the deal he reached, right? And so Mark Twain infamously calls it the Compromise of 1876, a reference to the Compromise of um, 1850, the Missouri Compromise, the Grand Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise. Uh, and so uh, whatever happens, happens though. Uh, Hayes becomes president, Tilden gets thrown under the bus by his own party, right? The Southern Democrats, they, they throw Tilden under the bus to get a president. Why? Well, if you're a Southern Democrat, it'd be nice to have a Northern Democrat as president, but it'd be even nicer to have a Republican as president who doesn't care about being that would be that would be the best, right? Uh, and so that's the deal that Hayes takes. The little devil on the shoulder tells him to take it, and he does. And so Hayes becomes president on a good world tour after the election. The first place he goes to Tallahassee, Florida, and he tells a group of freedmen that your rights would be better protected if let alone by the federal government. Uh, and of course, you know the freedmen are born at night, but not last night. They're not stupid. They know that Hayes is lying. They know that without the federal government, no one's going to protect their voting rights. No one's going to protect them from sharecropping. No one's gonna protect them in the gay, 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 except themselves, in the that they're able to do it. Uh, and so they know that they, that's the sound of the train coming to ride right over them, right? Uh, and so it's the deal that Hayes is striking if he takes it, right? Reconstruction effectively ends. The troops are pulled out of the South, and the government's enforcement for any of those federal laws just stops, right? So there's a, there's a Civil Rights Act on the books, but it's not enforced at all, right? Uh, and so, uh, and you may recall, the reason we care about the dates Technically, Hayes becomes president in March of 1877, but 1876 has such a wonderfully awful symbolic significance because it's, of course, the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, right? It's the 100 years since the, Civil, uh, the Revolutionary War started. And so they look, they try really hard for a, a name for Hayes, and eventually they come up with uh, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, or his fraudulency. Mark Twain is a big fan of his fraudulency. Uh, and so it seems that a lot of people are symptomatic of, of the sort of post-Civil War kind of you know, corruption and sort of uh, political mess that we get ourselves into uh, that all this happened, right? Hayes, of course, is gonna serve one term as, as president. Uh, he's not gonna run again because of the, the obvious uh, sort of plot, plot cloud over his presidency for the problems of 1876, right? Uh, but so that's how the Southerners get Reconstruction to end, uh, and they get to end on their terms. Another thing that's really important to mention is that 
the old phrase that you always hear people say is the winners write the history books, right? And to a certain